graduate school for sociology. I got into sociology because when I was an undergrad, <clears throat> I was uh, really interested in marketing and the ideas related to marketing. And as part of my marketing degree, I had to take a sociology course. And when I took the sociology course, I thought to myself, this is far more important for marketing than any of this stuff that they're teaching in marketing, right? Because sociology is basically, why do groups of people do different things? So I, I transferred out of marketing and I got into sociology. And I have my own weak tie story about how I got into this business. But the, the, again, the topic of this, of this presentation is the strength of weak ties using online social networking to pocket social capital. I've been incorporating um, themes and theories from sociology into my, my law business ever since I got interested in it. And the two things here, the strength of weak ties and social capital are, um, are uh, theoretically based um, uh, concepts that we discuss a lot in sociology. And I'm going to show you how they apply to your law practice. So like I said, I have my own weak ties story. That's my wife back there, Summer Luther. She's an attorney. And uh, I'm to tell you this story to demonstrate the, the strength of weak ties. Like I said, I was an undergraduate and I was a marketing student. When I got to Colorado, I knew one person. So my social network involved one, myself and one person. So we'll call this two, OK? I went trying to find a job. I couldn't find a job anywhere. Some guy in my class said his uh, older brother ran a valet company in town, and he could probably get me on part-time as a valet at night. So there I was. I was still a marketing student looking for marketing opportunities. While I was standing there at the valet station, I thought to myself as I passed out valet tickets, you know, the other side of these valet tickets could be, could be sold to advertisers. I wonder if the valet companies would let me do that. So I got a couple of them involved, and they said, yeah, sure, you could give it a try. It's not going to work, but you can give it a shot. So I did it. And it worked. So I continued to work as a valet at night because I worked in Cherry Creek and I had exposure and access to all of these wealthy people that went to Cherry Creek to, to do their shopping and to do their, uh, their eating and whatnot. And um, successful people come to Cherry Creek. So I'm trying to grow this valet ads business, finish my undergraduate degree, and kind of figure out what I'm going to do with my life. And then along comes this woman with her friend, and she's out celebrating her very first victory, um, her very first trial victory. It was her first trial and her first victory. So at this point, she's undefeated. She's very, very brave. So she comes and asks me and my friend at the valet, well, she doesn't, her friend does, at the valet stand, if there's anybody there that's our age or should they move on, my friend tells them that they should move on. Not only they should move on, but they should move on with us. Because <laughs> we were just closing. So we end up here at the uh, Cherry Cricket, the four of us. And um, then sometime down the road, this becomes a family tree. There's all these kids and everything. Uh, we get married. There's some love involved in that. And anyway, at some point in this area where Summer and I first started dating, I was trying to learn for myself how to develop websites, what the concept of search engine optimization was, and how it could benefit me in this valet ads business that, that I was building. So I was doing some of my own graphic design and stuff. I, my clients were the Nuggets, the Pepsi Center, Mercedes-Benz, some different apartment complexes. I was, doing I was doing fairly well. But I wanted to take this thing national. So Summer is involved in this organization called the Trial, Colorado Trial Lawyers Association, right? And so there's this listserv. And people put on this listserv all the time. Do you know anyone who's a graphic designer or who's a web designer or anything like that? I need some help for my business. So she kept saying, well, I know this guy. He's kind of sketchy, but he does stuff like that. And uh, before I knew it, I had this base of business that I had never even considered before. New information had come into my network that wasn't previously there. And this business ended up being far more successful and far more fulfilling than what I had originally planned on. So if I hadn't developed this network of ties, if I hadn't built up this social capital, that opportunity would have never been presented to me. If I wasn't willing to go out of this circle right here and pursue these interests and these people that had something in mind for me, I wouldn't have gotten here to where I am today. 
So I really consider myself a sociologist, not so much a marketer. I just employ sociology into the marketing that I do. And I think that um, the importance of social capital and the strength of weak ties are what I really want you to take away from this presentation today. We're going to talk about making a Facebook page and Twitter page, but what I really want you to understand is why that's important. It's important because, well, from a sociological perspective, sociology goes through these phases, if you will, these generational movements. We get focused on something, then someone loses interest, and we move on to another thing. But in sociology, you know, generally it's accepted that it started as a result of the Industrial Revolution. We wanted to know what happened when people went from agrarian societies to what are called mechanic, or I mean, uh, metropolitan societies. You know what happens when those family ties are broken and people are injected into a city and their jobs change, their values change, their lives change. And then that passed and then we wanted to look at civil rights issues and we have the 50s and 60s and so sociologists are looking at uh, what have been the consequences for African Americans and other minorities in these countries and what kind of systems have contributed to those consequences. And then we thought we had that figured out and so we moved on to like rational choice theory and why do people decide what they decide and things of that nature. And then, as I'm doing my graduate work, this is on the cusp of right before 2008 when the, the banks and everything are going to crash. But we already, in sociology, have embraced the idea of stratification. And what stratification is, is how are people laid out across an economic and social line? And this is easy now because we have all these Occupy movements and stuff, but stratification means that we have people that follow this line. This is top, we'll call this just top dollar and this is poverty, okay? Why is it that some people end up here and some people end up here? How many people end up here? Are people moving up? Are people moving down? And what we knew back in uh, 2006 and 2007 is that this cluster right here was growing. This is before all the Occupy things, okay? This part right here was getting very small. And so the focus of sociology became, what's going on here? Why is there so much movement down? Why is it so hard to get, top, get to the top? And why is there a collection here? So we had to review everything that we, that we had discussed, industrial revolution and civil rights and all, all sorts of things, and try and figure out what had happened. Because through the 70s and 80s, sociologists and social workers and policymakers will tell you that they work together to implement programs um, like raising the minimum wage and giving minorities access to college and uh, what was that thing, uh, affirmative action, okay? So we're inje injecting money um, into this range here and we're trying to get, get it to move up. Well, by the 2000s, we had to recognize that that injection of money to this area was not doing anything. Okay, so there's a profound moment in which it's realized that money's not as important as you would think for making a person successful. There's something else besides money. Money can't explain. You can't give, you can't give a group of people money or one person money and then get success from them. There's something else going on because we've tried that. Now, albeit I don't think we've tried to the extent that's possible. But there is, there is something to be said about the fact that, you know, money's not doing it. These people aren't moving up for some other reason. What is that reason? Well, there was a concept that uh, Pierre Bourdieu <laughs> coined in the 70s, and this is a quote from it from the 80s. But it was this idea of social capital. So not money capital or not currency, but something else that allowed people to move either up or down this line of stratification. And he says that social capital is the aggregate of the actual or potential resources which are linked to possession of a durable network of more or less institutionalized relationships of mutual acquaintance and recognition. All right, so simply put, people, institutions, and knowledge are resources that one can draw from to improve one's social status. Much like money, the more friends, acquaintances, and professional ties one has, the more knowledge one has, the more likely one is to be successful in a specific pursuit. Does that make sense? So we're pulling and accumulating social capital from all sorts of places and we probably don't realize it. The ABVA is a source of social capital. 
if you're on a listserv, that's a source of social capital. If you know the guy that makes your coffee in the morning, that too could be a source of social capital. There's some knowledge that could be drawn from that relationship that could help contribute to your success. Because as I've said before, money's not enough to explain why people become successful. So that's the first concept, social capital. And, and, it'll get, and we're going to discuss how using so, online social networking can help you build social capital. But the second term that I want you to understand is an, this idea of weak ties. All right? And when I say ties, I'm talking about interpersonal ties. Okay? Mike's tie to me is very different from my wife's tie to me, which is very different from Dave's, and which is very different to strangers that I've just met. But an interpersonal tie can be broken down into three distinct types. It's either strong, it's weak, or it's absent. All right? And the strength of an interpersonal tie can be correlated to the amount of time one spends with, one another, with another, the emotional intensity of that relationship, the level of intimacy or mutual confiding, uh, and the level of reciprocity. So the more of the, the more time you spent with somebody, the more emotional you are with somebody, the more you confide with them, the stronger that tie gets. So it moves from either non-existent, which is what the two of you and I had this morning, to weak, which is what we have now, and then to strong, depending on how long we hang out with each other after the presentation. So what we want to do is we want to create an ideal type weak tie that can help us bring information and social capital into our, uh, into our network. So the ideal type weak tie that we're looking to create with the social networking is a weak tie that's, in, that's low time, low emotion, low intimacy, but high reciprocity. Okay? Reciprocity means I give you something, you give me something back. So we can use weak ties to accumulate social capital. Because I talked about some primary groups that you may be involved in. So the ABBA might be a primary group that you're involved in. A family is even a better example of a primary group that you're involved in. And so weak ties reduce the dependency on primary groups for new information. Weak ties are also large scale, low intensity interactions that feed information back into our small primary groups. And this feedback actually strengthens and injects our primary groups with more social capital. Because we've got more information from these weak ties that we've brought in. And that information also creates a value proposition to that primary group saying, hey, this is what I have to offer. Um, you can probably think about your primary groups, whether they be personal or professional, and you can probably identify pretty quickly the person that you would go to if you had an issue that needed to be resolved. Again, whether it was personal or professional, you probably have an innate sense of who it is that's able to bring more social capital to that group, who's able to bring more information to that group and make whatever issue it is that you're having uh, success or at least clarify it. So the exercise that I wanted to do, I want you all to get up for one minute, go to a different section of the room, and as quietly as possible, as quietly as possible, I want you to tell each other if you know of any job openings anywhere. Okay, everybody switch partners with someone you don't know now. I'll take Dave. Okay. Here's the question I want you to answer now. Do you know anybody looking for a job? Any kind of job, okay? Oh, were you guys together before? Okay. That's good. So everybody go back to your seats. So in your first group, in your first in your first pairing, how many jobs were, was your pair able to, to remember that were available? One. Okay, and then your second question, how many people did you know that were looking for a job? 
Okay. Okay. So as a small primary group, there was a very limited amount of information that we have. But as we come together, we now can demonstrate that we could identify, it sounded like, eight jobs and possibly 16 <laughs> applicants. And I won't, and usually I go around and say, what was it? And I'd see if there was any opportunity to pair, to, to pair them, but we'll, we, we just won't do that this time. But you can see how a small primary group limits the amount of information. We become reliant on that small primary group for almost everything. If we don't branch out, we can't help ourselves and we can't help anybody else. Again, this online social networking will give us an opportunity to do that. So we're just going to define uh, online social marketing. And this is just a definition that I came up with. Um, it's a purposeful online outreach program with the aim of creating weak ties to bring new information and social capital to an individual or a primary group. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So let's break it down again and let's emphasize something. It's a purposeful online outreach program with the goal of creating weak ties to bring new information social capital to an individual or primary group. So I know that this sheet is numbered wrong and that's on purpose, but if you're going to make the decision to, create, to, to build your weak ties, increase your social capital, and to do it through a social networking, problem, uh, uh, social networking program, I think there are three important questions that you need to ask yourself as you get started. And again, they're not in any particular order um, they, they would be different for an attorney or a marketing assistant or an administrator. But what is the purpose of this social network outside of generating weak ties and social capital? What kind of new information am I looking to either distribute or acquire? Because remember, this is a reciprocity relationship, so you have to give to get. And who will uh, the social networking program benefit the most? And so if I was, you know, Mike and I was um, directing this thing and I had <coughs> responsibilities to ABBA, I might start at, at, at the bottom one. Who will the information benefit? And I'd say, okay, I need to create a social network that's going to benefit my membership. What is the purpose of that? His purpose may be to ben in, in benefiting the membership. He may be able to build the membership. If, if rumors swirl that Mike's great at this, uh, more people might start attending and enrolling, and you know, with uh, more membership comes more opportunities to, to uh, create bigger and better programs. And then what kind of new information does the ABBA want to disseminate and collect? So what type of law firm do you work for? It is a general practice. We do everything, but I do family law. You do family law specifically, okay. And how about you? Um, I'm a sole practitioner. You're a sole practitioner, mm -hmm. okay. So if, and you work for a firm? Yeah. yeah, you work for a firm. So you're an associate at a firm. Okay, and you might, so you may say that you want to um, build uh, more awareness about the family law um, part of the law firm that you work for. So you may be willing to commit your own time to creating a social network um, to bring information in and out, which hopefully would translate to cases in and out, which would give you some leverage to move up. That could be your purpose, that could be your information, and that could be your benefit. As a solo practitioner, I don't know how long you've been in practice, but I suspect that um, your primary focus would be generating possible leads for your cases, either through other attorneys or just through um, being online in general. So whatever your preference is, you would say, since we do this for attorneys, we have to make a decision, right, when we first set up social networks. Our decision is made that the purpose of our online social networking that we do for our attorneys is to generate new clients that they would not, they would not otherwise get through a traditional referral service, okay? You would have to make a decision. Do I want to create an online social network of other attorneys and share legal information with them so that I can get referrals from them? Or do I want to go out and start an online social networking program with the aim of finding people who aren't going to find me anyway? Because the language that you would use on, uh, with those two different strategies is vastly different. You wouldn't go speaking legal ease if you were trying or talking about case law or citing CR numbers if you were trying to get 
new clients, you'd want to be talking to them about the issues that they're facing and vice versa if you're trying to attract attorneys and get them to subscribe to your feeds or whatever, you'd probably want to use legalese in that sense and quote case law, things of that nature. So the difference between online social networking websites and a traditional website is that online social networking is like dynamic, okay? Dynamic means it's always moving. And the expectation is that people who engage in these networks or who participate in these networks are updating them regularly. They're providing fresh content regularly. As opposed to a traditional legal website, which is what we call static, unless you have social networking in, embedded in it, you have static information. It goes up, it says, this is how long I've been in practice, this is where my office is, and it pretty much stays the same. So a user does not, is not motivated to visit a, web, a static website every week to see if anything is new, new is on there because that's not the purpose of the website. Social networking, the purpose is to get people to engage with you, to be engaged with other people, to start subscription links and groups and things of this nature, and to transfer information on a semi-regular or pretty regular basis. Okay, it's a short form engagement, so it's sentences, not paragraphs. I mean, if you're familiar with Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook, you know on Facebook you get cut off after a certain point. Twitter gives you 160 characters, LinkedIn, something very similar. So it's not meant for in-depth posting of information, it's more meant for short, fast conversations. And it's also pri private. It doesn't have to be public. You can create an online social network that is not accessible by the public. You can exclude users. You can do a lot of things to protect your privacy within your profile. You can build your own groups um, related to, in your case, you may go build an adoption group. And probably what you want to do is find other adoption attorneys outside of Denver, maybe even outside of Colorado, and build a network of those attorneys that you can swap information with. Again, this is a low emotional, low time, high reciprocity relationship that can bring information into your firm that wasn't going to be there, uh, that wasn't going to arrive on its own. Um, so I talked about inclusion or exclusion. Um, and then it's free. Building a website costs money. Maintaining a website costs money. Adding content to a website costs money. Um, uh, all of these social networking sites, I can't think of any that you have to pay for, but they're free. I think you can pay for some advanced features in LinkedIn, but. Um, but that's that. So where do we start? So what I've done is I've identified the three um, most visited social networking sites on the web. And we want to use these ones because we want the most people who do a search related to whatever it is that are related to our practice to be able to find us. And if you're on some very small site that no one knows of, the chances of that go way down. But if you're exposing yourself to millions of people being these, via these sites, then the chances of being found goes way up. So the three primary ones are Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Uh, these, are, these are free. They allow you to create a profile. They all allow you to create groups to include or exclude people um, to, to protect your privacy or to throw yourself out there, whatever it is that you want to do. And then I've added down here ping.fm, and that's not a mistake. That's actually what it is. Ping.fm is called an aggregator. And so in my business, efficiency is everything. If someone doesn't get something done or has to do it three times, I lose money, right? So we're always trying to find ways to do what it is that we do faster. And what ping.fm does, and you just go www.ping.fm, is you can enter in um, all your social networks that you're a part of. You enter in your username and your password. And then it links to your social network so that you can just make a post once and it's simulcasted out to every network that you're a part of. Rather than having to go into four or five different social network sites, you're able just to go from one dashboard and post it out. You can incorporate that into ping into um, Blogger and all sorts of other things that I haven't mentioned here, MySpace, um, all sorts of things. It's probably got, 50 to 100 different kinds of social networking sites that you can that you can blast out to this post. So it's also a good place. Ping FM is just a good place to go in general to look at new sites that the um, webmasters of the world think are important. You know, MySpace used to always be much better than Facebook. 
Um, and then that flipped, and if you were to go out right now and spend a lot of time on MySpace, it'd probably be wasted time. You want to focus on Facebook. So Ping FM also gives you an opportunity to kind of rank what's hot and not, and where do you, where, where's your time best spent. Again, these are links that are in your materials that you can go out and um, create profiles um, and, and then start your online social networking. So th this is the strategy. This is, this is the part, this is where my company makes all the money because the attorneys that I work with just don't want to do this stuff. So we become responsible for the strategy and for the, t the time management. But you know, if you're going to do anything, in my opinion, it's worth doing totally awesome rather than worth doing totally crappy. So if you're going, if you're a new attorney and you're trying to either leverage your firm by getting more cases for them or you're trying to build your practice and you're going to use this, you're going to want to put a program in place that's consistent. You're going to want to ask yourself how many posts I'm, am I going to do, who's going to do them if you have a staff and when. You're more likely to be found within the search engines and within these social networks if you are consistent. If you post every week or you post every day or you leave every two weeks, but whatever it is that you're consistent. If you go post a bunch of stuff in November and then you don't touch it December through February and then you post one in March, the chances of your post and information being found drop dramatically. So the important thing about the social networking management strategy is to make decisions about how often you're going to do it, who's going to do it if it's not going to be you, and when they're going to do it so that you can at least have consistency because it's going to take you probably 20 minutes per site to go set up your initial social networking site and then you're going to go spend 20 or 40 minutes at ping, entering all that stuff in there. And you don't want to waste that time by not having a good idea of what it is that you wanted to do. I gave you some examples of what I, you know, if I were in your shoes, what, how I would use social networking. So I think you have an idea of what the purpose would be for, but it would be to get as many weak ties as you possibly can, to engage as many people as you possibly can, which would mean if you join Twitter or these different sites, you would go out and look for people who are kind of like you but don't know you. You know what I mean? So you would go out and look for other adoption attorneys. And do you have a primary practice area yet? Appeals. Okay, so you would probably want to go out and find other appellate lawyers and make connections with them so that, and, and anytime you have some kind of insight, you blast it out there. And anytime they have some kind of insight, they blast it out there. And eventually you start connecting on these things, building your social capital, building your network of available resources, and starting to move up the scale. Because you can move up it without money, because money doesn't explain everything. And that is it for me. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. So do you recommend having a personal Facebook account and a business Facebook account or mixing both of them? Is that not a good idea? The question is, do I recommend having a personal Facebook account and a business Facebook account and whether or not to mix them and whether or not it's a good or bad idea? Well, that's going to depend on your strategy. If your strategy is to reach out to other attorneys, then it's probably, well, let me back up. What Facebook allows you to do is it allows you to have a personal page, right, that you can have with your friends and things of this nature. And then it also allows you to have a business page, right? So you can add a page that's just about your business and you can link the two. So it could, what's your name? Jamie. Jamie. So it can say, you know, at the top it says Jamie works at and then a link to Jamie's law firm, and that link is to your business page. So um, you can set your privacy settings on your personal page to protect you from potential clients that you're trying to find from being able to access your personal information while at the same time being able to access your business page. So my recommendation would be to create a business page and use that as your primary source of uh, social networking and make sure those privacy things are in place on the personal page so that when someone does find your business, they can't go find out where you live and what you're into and pictures of your dog and all that stuff. So yeah, Facebook is a two-pronged strategy, which I probably should have put in there. Personal page allows you to create the business page. Use the business page for the, for the social networking and make sure your privacy settings don't allow anyone who's not your friend to see the other stuff. Anything else? Yeah, sure. 
Should the posts that you post on Facebook versus LinkedIn versus Twitter be different? Because I know they kind of reach out to different types of markets. So when you're posting something on Facebook, should it be different than what you might post on LinkedIn? Like especially if you're going to use mm -hmm. content that goes to all of them or does it not matter? Mm -hmm. What we do is, um, because we do a lot of writing for attorneys, so we use the social networks like this. We write a new blog article or something related to our clients' practice areas, and then we go and post that on, their, on the blog portion of their website. And then we use Ping to blast out a link to that blog post, and it says, I just wrote something new about felonious killings or something. You know, whatever, whatever it was. In your case, you know, I just wrote something new about Haiti and adoption and then embed the link back to the original article. The benefit of that, this is getting a little outside of the social networking, but the benefit of that is that websites in general, static websites, are ranked by, uh, in large part, how many other sites link to them. And so when your social networking site links back to your website, it sends um, a message to Google and the other search engines that your website might be a little more important than one that isn't getting any links back to it. Um, as far as it being a different message, the, people that you are trying to reach are still the same. So a lot of, you know, I mean, I, I had a preference of um, Facebook over Twitter for a long time and rarely used Twitter. And now I use Twitter more um, as we've incorporated it, incorporated it into our business. So I think that posting the same thing on multiple sites doesn't do you any harm because I suspect that the usership is a little bit different for each site anyway. And LinkedIn, clearly the purpose of LinkedIn is for this kind of thing. You know, it's for business networking. Um, and, and, and so that's a much different user than a, a Twitter person. But I wouldn't be afraid to put the same thing. But what I would encourage you to do is when you have an opportunity to put a link back into your website or some kind of other marketing that you're doing to take advantage of it because it will only help that other marketing as well. So driving traffic somewhere. You know, the point of the post is, again, we're talking about reciprocity. So what information are you providing that might be valuable to someone so that at some point down the road or at that point they'll want to follow you? And follow basically means that you subscribe to the feed of somebody within these social networks so you can see every time they post. And so every time you post something new, you'll want that to be presented as valuable information. Um, but you'll also want them to come to you and you want to be able to come to them down the road too. So again, different users, different sites. Um, I'd probably post the same thing. If you have a, um, a Facebook business page, mm -hmm. which I do, mm -hmm. <coughs> does someone who's looking at that have to be your friend or can anyone just look at that? Yeah, the question is, uh, and I repeat these back for the camera, If um, if you have a Facebook business page, does the person who's looking at it have to be your friend or can it be anybody? No, the um, Facebook business pages are searchable in the little search box that's up above where your friends are. Um, if you search some kind of attorney or something like that, um, business pages start to pop up. So you can search mortgages or pipe cleaners or whatever it is that you want and those pages come up. You'll notice that if you, it, 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 will suggest first people that you're friends, but after that it will um, it will start giving you just business pages. And can that, can that person like your page without being a friend? That person can like your page without being your friend. Okay. And your page is m more likely to move up faster for a specific practice area um, with the more people who like it. The other thing with Facebook and your business page is that if you look at a URL, a Facebook URL um, for a business page that's not very popular, it says facebook.com forward slash 1872649 or 7-W-E-Z-Y-N-Y, whatever. If once you, you can specify when you set up your business page, this is what I'd like my URL to look like. So if you go to our consumer site, lawfather.com, if you go to facebook.com forward slash lawfather, you'll find our business page right away. And the reason that is, is because as soon as you get 25 likes, you're able to get that clean custom URL that you can then use in your other marketing. So um, they don't just give it to anybody. And it would require you going and having 25 of your friends liking the site. Um, but the more likes certainly reflects the higher it comes up in that Facebook search. 
The other thing, too, is that the Facebook um, search, if it doesn't have anything there, it defaults to Bing and to Yahoo. So if, it, if there is not a Facebook business page that it can find related to what um, you're, you've searched for, it will then show you the search returns for Bing and Yahoo. You don't always realize that. And um, LinkedIn and Twitter, um, Twitter especially, th those posts show up uh, in Bing and Yahoo search returns, and they show up really fast. <coughs> this has been a, a goal of Yahoo's is to give the freshest um, returns possible for any specific subject. And to that end, I believe they've made a deal with Twitter that shows Twitter posts in the first page of the search return. So if you have, uh, if you've just posted something on adoption or some appellate issue and someone searches it on Facebook and can't find it, they may find that in the default Yahoo slash Bing search return. And if you don't know Yahoo and Bing, you know, there were three major search engines. There were MSN, Yahoo, and Bing. MSN is Microsoft. MSN changed their search engine to call it Bing. And then Bing and Yahoo made a deal to share the algorithm. <coughs> so whatever you get on Bing is the exact same thing that you get on Yahoo. So essentially these days we only have two major search engines that we have to monitor and deal with, and that's the Bing-Yahoo relationship and Google. And Google takes about 60 to 70 percent of the search traffic right now, depending on who you ask, but the Bing-Yahoo um, group is definitely moving up. They're definitely becoming um, more popular search engines, and, and they're more, they, they seem to be, at this point, more friendly to these search returns from social networking sites. Yes, ma'am. I don't know if you can answer this question, but do you know, like, statistic-wise, how many law firms nowadays have websites? And, yeah, I mean, it's, it seems, <clears throat> you know, everybody has a website, and I'm still finding in Colorado, there are some attorneys who don't have websites mm -hmm. or, you know, don't promote business cards or, um, so I was just curious if that answers your question. As far as how many attorneys have websites. Or how I, many law firms. Have yeah. I don't have any statistics on that. I don't. Um, I can tell you that as far as search is concerned, online has surpassed the, uh, the yellow pages as the number one peop way people search for new products and services. And including attorneys. Um, but I can also tell you that my experience has been that attorneys pay more in generally for uh, phone book advertising than they're willing to put online. So it's um, an interesting uh, conundrum there that I'm sure time will, will phase out. But um, I know that with regard to the sponsored links that you can get on search returns, like Google, Yahoo, and Bing, you know, at the top and along the side, there's always those blue or gray boxes that say sponsored links. That attorneys is one of the most expensive. You could pay easily, depending on your practice area and what market you're in, 65 to $70 per click on those spots, and you, and you pay per click. So it's called PPC advertising. So what we do is organic search engine optimization, which means we do things to move your site onto the first page without having to pay for that. And um, that pay-per-click works on a bidding process. So you set a limit, and if anyone exceeds your limit, they show up over you. <laughs> and the last ones we did were at about $65, $70 per click. And that doesn't mean that that's a client. That's just somebody who did a search and found you. I've been to a lot of meetings where attorneys have been like, oh, so if I click on this, this will cost this asshole 70 bucks? And I'm like, yep. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> Anything else? Make sure you edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, Scott, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, thank you.